Well, welcome to this week's Graphics Programming Virtual Meetup. We follow the Berlin Code of Conduct. We have a Discord you should join, Twitter you should follow, and a YouTube channel you should subscribe to. <clears throat> this week we're covering Chapter 7 of the VK Mini Path Tracer. We're going to be talking about descriptors and only descriptors. Links to the tutorial and the source code. So by the end of the chapter, we're going to have this pretty picture in front of us. And that's going to be all we're going to have, but you'll see how much t uh, much stuff it takes to get there. So I mentioned descriptor, and that's what the chapter's about, but what are they? A descriptor itself is a reference to a piece of data or an array of data on the GPU. This includes things like buffers, but also images, and you can have arrays of buffers and images, and you can also use them to describe specific subparts of it. You can think of it like a pointer, um, just don't think of it as a actual like C++ pointer because they're not the same thing. One has more restrictions, the other has more uh, capabilities, and so they're just useful to, for just making a comparison. There are five objects related to descriptors. So a descriptor is just a reference to a piece of data, but they're stored in descriptor sets. So that's the actual collection of pointers. You can think of it like a shader binding table of pointers so that you, when you bind a descriptor set, you are pull, providing an entire set of pointers to all the data in that descriptor set. So descriptor pools are where they're allocated from. They are extremely similar to command pools, except for descriptor sets. Um, descriptor set layouts are the description of that shader binding table of that array of, of that list of pointers. <clears throat> Conceptually, it's very much like a function signature or function declaration in that it describes what the types are, what the, what the names are of them and our names, uh, locations are, but it doesn't tell you, it doesn't provide any actual data. So pipeline layouts are a collection of descriptor set layouts in our analogy of function signatures. It's a bit like an entire function signature, whereas a descriptor set layout individually refers to a single part of one, a pipeline layout refers to all of it. Um, it's not 100% accurate, but it is good enough for now. When you are Using descriptor sets, the process tends to be you create a layout, you create a pool using that layout large enough to fit as many descriptor sets as you need. You then allocate the descriptor set from it. So now you have storage allocated for the shader binding table. Um, you update those pointers inside the table with VK update descriptor sets. That's the actual step of writing pointers into the little table in which to use or in which to refer to the data you need. You, we could have created the pipeline layout after we created this set, the descriptor set layout, but regardless, you need to have this descriptor set layout before you can create the pipeline layout. But once you create the pipeline layout, you can use that when you bind the, when you create your pipeline, you can, you must use that when you create your pipeline. And then when you want to use the descriptor set you've made, you use command to bind descriptor sets. And you also need the pipeline layout and I maybe the uh, descriptor set layout. Actually, I think it's just pipeline layout. Yes, uh, I believe so. And so that's the general process of using a descriptor set. A nice visual description of what it would look like. So we have our descriptor pool, which contains the space for it. Our layout, which describes what it looks like, which feeds into our pipeline layout. Um, our descriptor set is the actual block of memory, and we update it using VK update descriptor sets. Descriptor sets are extremely complicated. They're flow flexible, but they're also very obtuse. This chart is made by David G uh, Digo uh, Digolia, Digoia, uh, it's, oh, there, yeah, Digo Dig Digoia, I can't pronounce it. But anyways, I highly recommend looking at this repository because it has about half dozen of these wonderful 
charts that do not spare any detail about the complexity of it. I'm not going to try to explain it to you, but this is like a visual representation of everything you reasonably can expect to do with a, a descriptor set. So this is a visual way to show how complex they are. Um, thankfully, one, we're not going to use all of those features, and two, we're going to let NVVK take care of a lot of the boilerplate. Like, if I were to write the descriptor set stuff by hand in this application, it'd be about 100, 120 lines of code. Maybe you could get it down to 60, but you, you don't want to do too much fewer because then you don't have anything useful that you can reuse. Here, this descriptor set container, um, it handles all of that and creates your pipelines, your uh, your pipeline layouts, your descriptor set layouts, it create, allocates the memory, creates the pool, it does everything that we need it to. Um, because we're only going to create one descriptor set and one descriptor set only needs one pool, it makes everything quite a bit simpler. So in our previous chapter, we, um, where is it? Uh, yeah, this previous, we had the pipeline object. We had our shader module, we had the shader stage create info, and then we had this pipeline layout object, but it was empty. Now we can fill it in. We're going to use the descriptor set container to fill it in, and the contains refers to that is what handles creating it and where it comes from. We also get the descriptor set from it, but to create the pipeline, we just need the layout. So this is, there's an invisible line that separates the necessary from other things that are provided. Well, I did say they were complicated, but I didn't really go into why. I'd like to list a couple of reasons. They are descriptor sets and descriptors are meant to allow grouping of different sets of data. And so you don't have just one big box of data that you write into. You can actually have multiple of them and then mix and match as you want. Ideally, they were designed around different update frequency. So you have some data that's updated every frame, some data that's only updated when you draw with a specific camera, some data that's per material, and then some that's a per mesh. And I believe the general idea is you know, per frame, you update once at the beginning of the frame. Per camera, you only update for each camera you render. Per material is just for every material inside the camera that's visible, you, uh, you, you bind all the data necessary and then you only have to bind it once then. And then per mesh, you only have to bind it, uh, you know, transformation matrices, that kind of stuff. And instancing and all sorts of other things come into play. But the idea is you don't update everything, you only update in piecemeal. Um, the other complication, this is the one I found to be most complicated, is if I create, if I want to render something with a descriptor set, I had to have you created a descriptor set layout and a pipeline layout that the pipeline uses the descriptor set. But Vulkan doesn't require you to use the exact pipeline layout or descriptor set layout that you created. You can simply create a new one that's compatible, that is, and it matches. There is language in the spec that describes what matching means. It's pretty simple. It's kind of like if you had two, uh, two functions and they had the exact same signature, then it'd be compatible. There's some some weirdness about what's at the end of it. They like the bottom parts can be compatible, but the top parts can't, or the top parts aren't. And it, it gets into that. Uh, the other aspect of why they're complicated is the fact that every uh, every time you want to submit work to the GPU, you create a command buffer and you write commands into it, then you submit it. But descriptor sets, you just call VK update descriptor sets at a random time, at a random place. It's not a part of the command buffer writing. So it's kind of off on its own. And when those writes get pushed to the uh, GPU uh, memory is not clear. Uh, there's also the restriction that if you use a descriptor set in a command buffer, you cannot change that descriptor set. You cannot update its contents. You have to wait until that uh, command buffer is completely finished being used. Well, Vulkan 1.2 adds a couple of things to make that a little bit easier to work around, but I hope that was a quick explanation as to why there's 
so many little things that make descriptor sets a very complicated topic in total. The thing I just uh, described about command buffer recording, the actual explicit way it's done, as in this is what we would do if you were using a descriptor set instead of just being an abstract. So this is what you'd do for rendering or recording a command buffer. You have to begin it. You bind the pipeline you need. In this case, we're doing compute. We would then bind the descriptor set using the compute bind point, and then we dispatch our compute shader. That way we're setting the shaders we need, the data we need, and then we're saying, okay, render this many things using that shader and uh, data, the data being the descriptor sets. And then you can end the command buffer. So it's just like a overview of what that process looks like. We are also going to be modifying the shader code this tutorial, except we're not gonna go into great detail the exact syntax of GLSL. We are, there is a lovely website called The Book of Shaders, and I highly suggest you read that if you wanna know more about shader programming in the abstract. I will explain what we're doing this chapter, but not in any great detail. The gist of what we'll be doing, even though I'm contradicting what I just said, is that we're gonna be coloring each pixel with a RGB value that's just the X and Y coordinate divided by the width and height. So it should be a gradient from black to um, full R and full G, so full red and full green. And if you remember on our first picture, it was like a lot of red, there was a lot of green, and there was some yellow in the middle, and that's where they're mixed together. It's yellow in the bottom right corner. But let's actually look at the shader code we're really editing. So this is our, our compute shader. We have the same thing from previously, this layout, and this is just defining our, our, work, our members, members? Um, our, our work area. What we'll be adding is this here, this here, and this is a descriptor set declaration. <laughs> There's a couple of components. We have our name, we have the contents of it. It's a buffer, so it's nice syntax highlighting shows us that it's a distinct part of the, the grammar, but we have a buffer that is actually just an array of floats, image data of type float. The binding equals zero and set equals zero refer to the descriptor set this this def this descriptor is in and the binding or the location in that set. So when I said a descriptor, I meant a pointer to a resource of data. What this is, let me can see if I highlight, is that descriptor. We can have multiple of them, but we need to distinguish between them in so we would have if we had multiple descriptors in a single set we would have the binding equals zero binding equals one binding equals two similarly if we had multiple sets we could have set zero and set one and inside set one we could have binding zero binding one binding two so that's a quick rundown of what that all is because we're only using one binding and one to set we with zero indexing we just have zero zero so the actual shader code, this is the entirety of our main function now. We can read the comments in meticulous detail, but I'll try to work through it quickly. We have our resolution, which we hard code. If you felt adventurous, you could create another descriptor binding that describes the resolution so that it could be independent uh, of the shader that's compiled because this will be compiled into the binary. Uh, if we wanted to make it dynamic, we'd have to program that in. So we get our pixel coordinate, which is gotten through our GL global invocation ID dot XY. And I'll explain this syntax in a second, this dot XY. Our coordinates are from our top left to the bottom right. So we go zero to one on the X axis and zero to one on the Y axis starting from the top right corner. Uh, instead of the bottom right corner, which is a very mathematical approach, computer graphics tends to be or is it this? Uh, flip it to whatever the left side should be because I don't know how the camera is going to flip it. <laughs> um, so we have our pixel coordinate, we have our resolution. We need to do a quick bounds check to make sure that anything outside of the image is just thrown away. That's because we don't want to write to any 
out of bounds memory addresses. If our res if our pixel out count was higher than our resolution, then oh, we we would be writing illegal values, and uh, that can cause bad things to happen. So now we want to get our pixel color. We're going to construct a vector three with the three values where our last value is just going to be zero, but the first two is going to be the pixel x location divided by the resolution dot x or the width, and then the pixel's y location divided by the height. And we're going to put that into the red and the green values. So this effectively is a number between zero and one that varies across the screen, and that's going to represent how much red is in it. So the further left you are, the more black, and the more the further right you go, all the way to one, you get all the way to up to full red. And then similarly on the y-axis, you get from zero to one, you get black to green. It's not really black, but whatever. So it's going to vary across the entire thing as you change each pixel coordinate. Lastly, we're going to want to store that pixel value we just uh, calculated. We need to get the index into the array because we just have a, if we look at the previous slide, we just have a big array of data. We don't have a two-dimensional array. We have a one-dimensional array. So we need to address into it as if it was two dimensions. So our linear index is going to be the width times the y value, so how many rows down, plus how many pixels across we need to go. Um, and then we use that index, and because it's a VEC3 we're storing in it, and we store each value individually, because it's a vector of, it's an array of floats, not VEC3s, so we have to store the R, the G, and the B channel separately. And as we can see here, we get the R, the G, and the B, and we store them at the linear index, which would be the, the position of the VEC3, but we have to multiply it by three because it contains three floats, not one, and then we add one, zero, one, and two to it to get our RGB. Um, if that isn't immediately clear, I, I'm just gonna keep moving because this is something you have to play with to kind of intuit as what's going on, so. The thing I mentioned I was going to talk about is the vectors. So in GLSL, VEC3, VEC4, and VEC2 are built-in types. If you had a in C++ a struct that contained two ints or two floats, that would be equivalent to a VEC2 in most cases of the word. But in GLSL, it comes with special abilities, that being addressing the variables in it using multiple different accessors, which means if you have a VEC3, it has an RGB component, which you can access using a dot R, a dot G, and a dot B, but you can also use X, Y, Z, W, and S, T, P, Q to access those, those up to four values. So if you have a VEC2, you could only get X and Y out of it, or R and G out of it, or S and T. If you have a VEC4, you can get all four and similar. But the coolest thing that comes out of vectors in GLSL is swizzling. It's an extremely convenient syntax that allows you to create a VEC2, one, or VEC1, 2, or 3. You could even just get a single float out of it, which is a VEC1. And you don't have to do anything other than list the components you want in the order you want them. So we have here my vector.xy say my vector is a VEC4, it gets the first two components and returns it as a VEC2 containing X, Y. If I did X, Y, Z, it'd get a VEC3 out of it. If I wanted a VEC4 out of my vector, and but I wanted the third value to be in all four places, I would do Z, 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 which is very handy to just, if you need to create vectors ad hoc. Similarly, if you wanted to reverse a vector, if you wanted to swap all the elements, instead of you could you could just do w z y x, and that would get you the invert or the reverse of it. It's swizzling is pretty nice, so that hopefully explains what this is because it's not seen in many other languages, if any other languages other than HLSL and other shading languages. Swizzling's cool, <laughs> suffice to say. Let's actually get onto the real code. It's 
pretty much just, I talked about it in detail. Now I'm just going to quickly show the code that needs to make it. We need to include a new header, and this is our helper descriptor sets, descriptor set container. Pretty simple. We are not going to be using debug printf. We can comment out all of this code that we did to our initialization. I would comment it out rather than delete it simply because it's very helpful to have debugging information available. You can use render doc, that's fine, but sometimes a printf is what you need. So keeping it, keeping it around is handy. So now we're going to actually create the pipe, the descriptor set layout. With our descriptor set container, we need to initialize it with a context. And then we're going to add a single binding to it. And this is for, can you, can this copy go away? Yes, it can. <laughs> I just have to not hover over it. It comes, it's, this is describing what's in our descriptor, are in our shader. It has one binding, so we're just going to add, call, add binding once. It's going to be at location at set zero. Actually, it doesn't explain what the parameters are. Um, so that's annoying. I think the tutorial didn't actually describe what the, the, um, the parameters are. I glossed over that. Either way, there's only one binding in that where there's only one thing in that binding. It's going to be of a type storage buffer. It's going to be in set zero, and it's going to be used in the compute shader bit. Uh, and we just call init layout to create the layout. It's very simple to use like this. To create the pipeline layout and the descriptor pool, we just need to call init pool and init pipeline layout. This one signifies how many descriptor sets we should allocate space for. We're only going to need one, so we only allocate one. The pipeline layout contains both all of the descriptor set layouts, but also the push constants, uh, which is a handy way to write data, small amounts of data into the shader at command buffer recording time, instead of in a descriptor set, which is outside of command buffer recording. but we aren't using them here, so we don't have any need to specify anything for it. We have our descriptor set allocated in a descriptor pool. We now need to fill it in with data. We describe, like I, I kept talking about descriptors as like a pointer to data, but unlike C++ pointers, you don't get them from a function like malloc or new, you construct them out of just a valid VK buffer or VK image handle and describe other aspects of the descriptor or of the, of the range you want to care about. So we need to fill in this descriptor write function or uh, struct, and this describes what data to fill into the descriptor set. And then we give it to VK update descriptor sets. So a descriptor is not an object directly. It is, I said constructed, it is described using the handle, the range you need. So we're going to use the full buffer size. But if it was an image, you can do things like a sub resource or a sub part of the image. And God, that's, I have a hard time co conveying the intricacy of the difference. Regardless, to actually get the data in there, we have to finish writing the, or describing the write, dis write descriptor write struct. We need to give it the index and the binding, as well as the information we want. And then we call update descriptor sets, which goes and fills in the data in the GPU. We need to update the pipeline layout before we had to create the struct and then cr uh, call the creates a VK pipeline layout create on it because descriptor set container does that 
for us, we can replace this block of code with this nice single line and it will do the right thing for us. We now have everything ready for command buffer recording. Before we do that, let's look at the actual layout of command bind descriptor sets. If this looks like a lot of text, it is, this is why descriptor sets are complicated because you can do all sorts of things. The gist is, it's a function that, it's a recording command, so we have to have the command buffer you're recording into. The bind point is which type of pipeline this descriptor set is going to be bound to. So the compute, the graphics, or now the ray tracing by pipeline type. We need the layout that was used or a compatible layout. It's easier to use the actual layout if you have it handy, but not necessary. If you are binding more than one set, or if you're binding a set at a location other than zero, then you have first set being something other than zero. But because we're doing set equals set number zero, it's going to be the first set is just zero. We're going to we're going to bind a we can bind more than one at a time. If we wanted to bind four, we could describe that we only do one. And this is the array of those descriptor sets. Here it's just the descriptor set handles. There's also dynamic offsets that we could use, and this is fancy stuff that we're not going to cover. Mm. Mm. Slides.com, can you not do that? Thank you. <laughs> this scroll bar stuff is what I was complaining about. <laughs> Actually binding it is just getting the set, which we're getting the first set or the zeroth set, and then binding it. So we just fill in all of those parameters. We're going to have our, we're going to call VK command bind descriptor sets using a command buffer we have ready with pipeline bind point of compute. We're going to get the layout from the descriptor set container, the pipeline layout. We have the first set is at place zero. We only have one set. Here's the pointer to an array of those sets, but because we only have one, we can just quickly take the address of the local variable, and then we have the zero null pointer for the things we aren't going to explain. And so now we've bound the uh, pipeline, we've bound the descriptor set, and can use it in further code. So now we're ready to do our dispatch call, but we need to make sure we dispatch as many work groups as is needed to cover the full image, because before we were just doing a debug printf thingy that it didn't really matter if we got the bounds right. We got some output and we were like, cool, we got output. That's all we care about. Now we need to make sure we get the exact size or as much as we, the exact size. We need to get as many work groups as is needed to cover the entire image. It's a pretty simple uh, formula equation. We have, these are the, the 3D coordinates or the 3D bounds, uh, because we're not doing anything in the z-axis, it's going to be one. But for our x and a y, we're just going to take the render width divided by the work group width. So if our work group th width was 32 and our render width was 800, divide those two and then take the ceiling of it. Similarly for the render height and work group height. The ceiling function can be approximated using this lovely thing where we, we um, the divisor we divide or we subtract one from and then we add it to it and dividing it will give us a value between no it will not ah. yes it's 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 the integer ceiling value of this of a and b a divided by b yes anyways we we use that here i i kept the code here because that is what this function is doing. The render width plus work group width minus one divided by work group width. So that gets us however many work groups we needed to cover the full range. And lastly, we need to clean up after we're done, which is just calling dinit. Very simple, very easy. Again, VV, and VVK does all the hard stuff for us. And we get this lovely, lovely image. We have red on the x-axis, green on the y-axis, and yellow where they both go to one. One little thing, it's 
not obvious, but in our layout description, we described it as a f array of floats rather than an array of color values or VEC3s. We did that because we didn't have the scalar block layout specified. While it would have been nice if this would work on its own in GLSL due to legacy, if you try to index into it, it would still do it on the floating point boundaries. So in linear index should be 0, 1, 2, as in 0, 1, 2 of a VEC3, VEC3, VEC3 in a row. What will actually happen is the zeroth will just be the RGB, and then the one address will be the BGR of instead, uh, and where the R is of the, of the first, uh, the, the second color in it. So it will, it will alias it, no, not alias it, it will um, <laughs> write it incorrectly. There's a very cool image in the tutorial that shows you what it looks like if you get it wrong. The thing we do here is to fix, to make it, the reason we're wanting, we want to add this capability is just to make it easier to write the data into the array. Instead of having to write each component individually, we just get the index by itself and index into it using a VEC3 size. We have to add the scalar qualifier here. And we also have to enable the extension to enable it, but it's pretty well supported from what I understand. So it reduces the pixel, the image data write from three lines to one. It's easy to forget that though, so watch out. Um, one thing I noticed just from reading through the chapter and knowing how um, debug printf is implemented, it's curious to wonder how does debug printf work if there's no descriptor sets? How does the data written in the shader from printf get back to the CPU? Well, it creates a descriptor set in the background behind your back, and now we've just recreated it ourselves and we can control everything we want about it. So I like that kind of parallel because we, we'd use something that did our work for us and now we're doing it ourselves and we can see exactly how it's done. Uh, lastly, there is a nice article that goes a bit more into detail about how shader binding works by NVIDIA. And I, I recommend reading it. It's four years old, but it's still accurate. API hasn't changed that much. So that's it. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Any comments? Can I put the link for the article? Yes. To the let, me, let me put this. Yeah, and I will put it in the Can I later. chat? Oh, I didn't have chat open. Thank you for linking it, Alan. Uh, I just now saw your uh, Vulcan diagrams uh, link. So, yeah, now next week we're going to actually get into path tracing for, for once or ray tracing and actually doing interesting things instead of just setting up our context. So I think that will be all. Thanks for listening. I'm going to stop screen sharing now.